Okay. Um, so thank you so much to the conference organizers for convening such a vital and thought provoking few days of conversation. Um, you know, it's so nice to see so many of you uh, again. Uh, I'm going to be speaking today about some recent climate justice cases that prompt a rethinking of the traditional politics of recognition and human rights discursive frameworks. This builds on my work on in human rights temporality and everyday violence, but I'm just beginning to think through its implications for climate insecurity and justice. So, you know, bear with me. Um, all right. So the case study that I'd like to examine today is the Sachi et al. versus Argentina, Brazil, France, Germany, and Turkey. Uh, this petition was filed in 2019 on behalf of 16 children and young people, all under the age of 18 when the petition was filed, and they're from 12 different countries. The children and young people named in the complaint include the famous Greta Thunberg of Sweden, as well as indigenous children from the Marshall Islands and nationals of Nigeria, Palau, South Africa, Tunisia, the US, France, and more. The complaint sought to hold the five named G20 countries responsible for the negative impact of their carbon emissions on the, on the rights of children. The petition claims that the five countries, quote, failed to prevent and mitigate the consequences of climate change, recklessly causing and perpetuating life-threatening climate change. They claim that, quote, the climate crisis is not an abstract threat and that the state's party has failed to take necessary preventative and precautionary measures to respect, protect, and fulfill their rights to life, health, and culture. In other words, the child's best interest under the UN conventions of the rights, rights of the child. Uh, and this is the this is a picture of the response that they got to the case um, in 2019 the the complaint was found inadmissible for quote a failure to exhaust domestic remedies. It was a landmark case, though, insofar as it was the first to hold multiple states parties responsible for human rights violations related to climate change. It determined that states do have quote extraterritorial obligations with regards to climate change. End quote. And it was significant also because it brought the rights of children and their futurity into the legal conversation around climate change, cite, citing specifically the failure of states to, quote, ensure intergenerational justice for children. After the decision, Caterina Lorenzo, pictured here, um, she's 14 of Brazil, stated, I'm disappointed and worried. We have scientific proof that those countries are impacting our climate, and yet this case was not accepted. We have our own stories to show how we are being impacted by the current climate change, and yet the case was still not accepted. I'm disappointed in the committee for not seeing this case as, as admissible in a moment in which we are desperate for real and effective action as we are facing a, clim a, a crisis, the climate crisis. This case has since prompted several subsequent actions, including the general comment number 26 on children's rights and the environment with a special focus on climate change dropped by the Committee on the Rights of the Child, and the most recent 2021 children's petition to the United States, excuse me, the United Nations Secretary General to declare a climate emergency. Uh, and that's the one I'll be turning to a bit later. So I'm interested in this case and the petition brought by the children, not only because of their important work in advancing climate justice, but also because of what they offer, what, what this case offers and these sort of, you know, subsequent, subsequent cases, um, because of what they offer the larger conversation on human rights, insecurity, subjectivity, and temporality. In this paper, I take up a transnational rhetorical feminist lens that accounts for both the tangible effects of nation state borders, as well as the discursive effects of human rights, climate justice, and feminist discourses as they cross disciplinary and geographical boundaries. Building on Wendy Hesworth's work on spectacular and exceptional violence, I argue that the normative rhetorical frames of human rights and humanitarianism steeped in spectacularity and crisis do not account adequately for the everyday violence of climate change, including gendered structural violence, which of course we've just heard about, um, or other kinds of violence against rights holders that fall outside of the normative indiv individualized autonomous subject of rights. I first critique the politics of recognition in human rights discourse and then situate these, this case study within a framework of everyday violence that puts pressure on legal and normative human rights discourses in order to exemplify the importance of a rhetoric of everyday violence for climate justice. Human rights discourse is accustomed to thinking on the level of the individual, the national, the spectacular, as dominant temporal tropes that ignore or deny everyday violence, futurity, or non-autonomous human rights subjects. 
As Wendy Husford articulates in her most recent book, Violent Exceptions, the humanitarian paradigm of human rights activates the sensibility predicated on individual and exceptional suffering, um, excuse me, that can, re that can serve to reinforce geopolitical structures of power and political sovereignty because it frames rights as immediate, individualized crisis and resilience oriented, which thus forecloses a recognition of the structural and ongoing causes of violations. These rhetorical frames of temporality and crisis in human rights and humanitarian politics of recognition function to create a certain kinds of publics then attuned to retroactive violations that fit a normative and dominant conception of rights, and thus certain kinds of subjects who must fit the normative conception of rights holders. In other words, normative human rights subjects must be agentic subjects who claim rights, and humanitarian subjects must be vulnerable, non-agentic recipients or objects of rights. Again, which we've also we've already heard about in terms of in um, in terms of women being figured as vulnerable victims. As I have argued elsewhere, um, as Hannah Arendt tells us, it is precisely the moment of violation in which those who require recognition the most are denied the very humanity and personhood upon which that recognition is based. Therefore, for precarious populations, it is simultaneously always the right time and never the right time to stake a rights claim because these paradoxical frames of recognition around what is considered human rights, uh, excuse me, around what is considered human always already delimit rights claims. Children in particular, Hesford argues, bring this problematic into relief. The legal doctrine that defines children's, uh, children's rights, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, or the CRC, position children as recipients of rights, but not human rights subjects in their own right, meaning that children are always the exception before the law and must rely on the best interest principle, which is Article 3 here. Simultaneously, children's rights are permeated by what Hesford argues can be violent rhetorics of exception and vulnerability that figure children as innocent victims who must be saved. Thus, the child is a unique human rights subject because the child is historically not seen as fully autonomous and agentic, and thus must be advocated for or on behalf of as an object of rights, leaving open the ability for the rhetor um, to exploit the space of advocacy and insert their own agenda. I would further argue that most third generation or non-individualized distributed agency rights holders fit into this category, including indigenous rights and environmental rights. However, as Joey Slaughter argues, the human of human rights, quote, the human of human rights is not simply given. Historically, the legal category of person precedes the human of human rights. Juridically, the legal category of a person carries certain rights and duties that precede the individual that perhaps await activation in or occupation by the human, end quote. So we know that corporations have legal personhood, but Slaughter's argument points out the colonial charter co corporations like the Dutch East India Company were granted legal status as persons before the law and subjects of rights well before what we now know as human rights came into being because of their transnational status and demand for international rights. In other words, quote, corporations and especially the colonial charter companies were recognized as international persons in advance of the human beings they ostensibly served. So thus, this individualized notion of human rights is attached uniquely, as attached uniquely to humans is a well-known fiction. This begs the question, how do we understand climate justice within human rights rhetorical frames of recognition when the forces of agency and individuality are distributed, not only in terms of the subject of rights, but also in terms of the perpetrator of violence? So I argue that the, um, the Saatchi et al. versus Argentina et al. case study I mentioned at the start sort of complicates and puts pressure on the legal and normative discourse of human rights and exceptional humanitarianism when the forces of agency are distributed, not, not only in terms of that subject of rights, you know, the children named in the suit are standing in for all children, um, but also in terms of the perpetrators in suing multiple countries and petitioning the UN, the focus of the violation is not grounded in traditional state-centric rights logic and traditional historical temporalities of rights violations and humanitarian logic. So in order to answer the above question, this paper offers a rhetoric of everyday violence as a way to make legible transnational structural rights violations as they play out as gendered and distributed violence in localized setting. Settings, excuse me. Briefly, I theorize the conception of, of the everyday as operating in opposition to the event. By definition, crisis exists only as something other than the everyday and disruptive of that chronology. However, the problem is that exceptional and everyday violence actually exists sort of contemporaneously and that the most structurally precarious are already more vulnerable to the event. But in the very moment an action or event 
erupts from the commonplace and is deemed eventful, it ceases to become ordinary every day. By this logic, humanitarian and human rights work ends up ignoring the everyday and structural violence for the spectacular crisis violence. And the everyday becomes impossible to recognize on any major scale. In the last few minutes remaining, then, I'd like to return to the petition by the children to examine what they have to offer this temporal paradox of everyday violence and human rights. So um, in the uh, subsequent more recent petition to the UN Secretary General to declare a climate emergency and mobilize a comprehensive UN response, the 13 young complainants uh, begin their argument by framing the problem as a crisis requiring immediate action, but for their future right to life. They begin with an epigraph from, the, from UNICEF that states the climate crisis is a child rights crisis and that they have, quote, spent their childhood trying to send a message to the adult world, time is running out. But despite decades of warnings, the international community continues to delay treating the climate crisis as the emergency it is, end quote. This language of emergency and futurity is important here because it understands the temporal recognitions of human rights as eventful and crisis oriented. In other words, the argument they're making is in multiple temporalities. You're violating our right to futurity now, and you, parentheses, will be violating our future rights if you don't act now. Quote, today, roughly one billion children live in countries that are extremely high risk of climate disasters, threatening their lives, health, education, and culture. More than 99% of the world's children are exposed to at least one environmental threat, end quote. Their frustration is palpable when they describe losing the legal case, Sachi et al. versus Argentina et al., because they're required to exhaust all appeals in each individual country first, which would take years. And by that time, they claim, quote, many of us will no longer be children, and many of us, especially those from small island states and indigenous communities, fear we will have become climate refugees by that time. We have no time to wait. The urgency is now, end quote. The urgency is now, even if the demand for rights is future oriented, albeit predicated on their subject positions as children who will inevitably become adults, thus losing not only their claim for the best interest principle, but also their claim to their futurity as thriving adults. Once again, it is never the right time and always the right time to stake a rights claim, particularly for climate justice, as the right time has passed and yet we must act now ad infinitum. So climate justice cannot be offered retroactively. There is no redress, no retributive, restorative, transnational justice for the climate crisis. But the demands of the rhetorical claim making push the discourse of human rights to its temporal limits when it is only framed as a crisis oriented discourse. Reframing human rights toward everyday violence offers us an opportunity to recognize different kinds of violence operating within different kinds of temporalities that are future oriented rather than retroactive and thus act to prevent it from ongoing. Thank you.